Welcome to another video from Dr. Locke. YouTube now has uh, short videos, they call them shorts, where it's like a minute long and it shows you the shows you the meat in the sandwich, so to speak. This is not one of those videos. They have normal videos too. This is more of a documentary on how I achieved uh, the ultimate accessory to any workshop, man cave or garage. And I'll tell you why it's the ultimate, is because we have a polished floor, a level polished floor, and this is about the journey, about how I ended up doing this and why I ended up doing it and, um, you know, the opportunity and all the rest. Now, I just want to point out a few things. This is a polished concrete floor uh, with glass coloured blue and white aggregate in the floor, completely level. And it also has uh, lids on top of the hoist as well. So what you're looking at here is a four ton hydraulic scissor lift. Uh, which is designed as a car hoist so that you can just simply roll the car on and lift it up and one of my requirements was is that if I'm going to do this I don't want a huge Frankenstein cut out uh, where they cut it out and then they lay a slab on a slab and you've got a huge concrete edge that always cracks and all the rest I wasn't really happy with that so I've decided to do it uh, a different way and because well as as you get through the video you'll see that uh, you know, I had the opportunity because I had uh, two slabs. First slab uh, was not done right. <clears throat> I gave the guy a stack of cash and we ended up with too much of a slant on the slab. Look, it was his mistake, it was my mistake. Shit happens. So we're out for a new slab. So once again, another stack of cash. And that gave me the opportunity to uh, then, you know, and the room to actually put in this particular type of scissor lift hoist. And um, this is the end result. You can walk over this. It's got a nice um, edge around it, metal galvanized edge. You walk on it, no problems. I was also able to put the drag on. And this is what we're seeing here. So as pretty as it looks, as nice as it looks, let's get going and let's see what it took to get this done. Welcome to my concreting nightmare. All right, so basically, um, we had a guy lay the concrete and we said uh, level with a slight slope. So if any water comes across it, um, it's going to dissipate the water. So what ended up happening was from one point here to over here is 300 mil. Now, if you know your millimeters, that's quite a bit. 300 mil is way too much slope. So it means everything on here is going to be on an angle. So anyway, um, that's why we've got some pavers there. We're basically just building it, uh, building it up and then putting 100 mil the whole way through. So re reusing all the rubble rather than getting it away and chucking it away. But that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is what we're doing here. So because the concrete was wrong, it now gave us another opportunity to install a car hoist. Now because post hoists take up too much room, too much space, what we've gone for is we've gone for an in-floor uh, scissor lift. So the benefit of uh, that would be is that it's going to be level to the floor and you know it's not going to be in our way and we can use it when we want because as you can see we've got the height so that's a bonus to have a scissor lift you know it won't be used a lot but um you know it will be used and in long term if you've got a controlled environment uh if you want to work on a car you'd you'd want a, a hoist so it comes in handy for all sorts of all sorts of things in our line of work, uh, we don't do a lot of car work, but sometimes we do fit outs or sometimes we're, we're just checking um, the cars or dropping the oil, doing things like that. So we decided to go, okay, since we've got this opportunity, we're going to do a car hoist. And this is what um, a lot of people won't tell you when it, you know, it comes to actually buying a, a car hoist. They won't actually tell you what's involved. Now, if you take our scenario, we've got the concrete, which is out of whack. And basically, we've had to build up one side and chisel in the other to level this off. Now we've been able to do that with um, with uh, some high high uh, PSI concrete, just a very fine layer, and then uh, self-leveling on top of that. To actually get this bit level, we've had to slice and dice, um, chisel out, and then form up, and then um, screed it across. You see the screed here? And those bolts there that are coming out of the ground, the threads, we've actually had to put threads on all four sides, put rails, two rails, and then um, form it and then screed it. And then it, with the self-leveling, it'll come up level. Now, you can add to that and do that in multiple coats, but you can only do very thin coats. So there's still like one little coat that needs to be done. This is how much work it takes to actually 
uh, built in a scissor lift. And had I have known that, you know, I think everybody kind of goes what they want the in the concrete kind of look, but it's a lot of work. It's almost as much. If we were to pay for it, we would have paid just as much for the concreting, uh, concrete work as we would to actually buy the lift. So just keep that in mind. The next thing here is this PVC pipe. I went backwards and forwards to the, su the supplier asking him, can I use steel? Can we get away with 100 mil? Because they wanted 110 mil PVC. And as you see, the gap from the PVC to the top is only like 50, 60 mil. You know, that's not much at all, especially when you've got cars going over this area. So they were, they gave me, they replied to two emails and never replied to me ever again. I guess I just asked too many questions. But I won't be linking them down in the description because uh, they've kind of uh, ghosted me pretty hard. And um, I will be buying a lift off them, but I'm not going to not going to link to them because you can buy lifts anywhere. Okay, so for the lifts you've got options 3 tonne, 3.5 tonne, 4 tonne. Four ton. We're going with a 4 tonne. Uh, it's always better to have more and not need it than have less and it collapse on you and kill you. So we've gone for the heaviest possible one that we could. Now this is 110, so one lift will sit here. The pipe will come through here, the hydraulics and airlines will come through here, and then it'll come through here and go up to there, and then we're going to make a special box for it. We're not going to use the custom box. Okay, so another couple of factors here. So I've made up this formwork here, and when the concrete goes down, uh, then we're going to remove these pieces of wood, and then everything should be in place. One of the things they wanted, and this is where the concreting becomes crazy, is they wanted a drain. And I understand if you've got a eight, $9,000 hoist, you don't want any water in there, uh, rusting up the hydraulics or anything so they on the plans they wanted a drain here's, here's the plans here if you can see them so they wanted a a six inch or a hundred uh yeah sorry 110 mil pvc drain um, at the back on each of them unfortunately we couldn't do that without concreting so what we came up with is a channel drain so that's about a, a 40 mil um, gouge and then it goes down to a pipe and it goes straight out. Now that's good enough. I mean, no water's going to get down there. The next thing um, I've still yet to do is put on some right angle around this. So I'm actually going to put boards on top of this. So it'll be 10 mil of um, plywood and then 10 mil of rubber. Uh, the hoist is 130, so that gives me 20 mil to play with. So 10 mil board, 10 mil rubber, put it in a nice frame around the top. So when you lift the lift up, the board comes up and then you can take the boards off, use the hoist, and when you finish, you put the boards back on top so it'll be a perfectly level floor that you can walk on that's not going to get in the way. So all of this extra work takes a lot of extra time, and this is what they kind of, um, you know, the concreting work would cost me as much as the hoist. So this is the stage I'm at. I just want to do a quick video on it because a lot of people, when considering um, digging it in or putting it on the surface, surface mount is going to be 10 times, 20 times quicker, and it's going to cost you a lot less. I had a mechanic um, who was actually going to buy um, the same type of hoist and do the exact same thing. He's already on concrete and I think when he finds out how much work's involved, he's going to actually just um, surface mount it. Because when they surface mount it's only 130, they put a ramp at the front, ramp at the back, they put a little bit of metal over this bit, a little bit of metal over this bit, and they're done in a day. They don't have to worry about drains either. This particular manufacturer didn't have a pre-made um, box for the, for the hoist. If they did, I could have just carved that in put that in and everything would have been 100% square. Instead, they give you plans and you've got to get everything right to the millimeter, which was very frustrating. But they're the only ones that had the four ton lift, so I had to go with them. Right, so here's my drains. I've, uh, I'm gonna be putting some U-shaped stuff over the top and then cementing over the top. But basically, uh, this drain has flow. And it goes all the way, it goes from here, picks up that one, goes down here, and then I've shot it out into the garden over there. In theory, this will only be water. Um, it won't be any real pollutants in in this at all, so it's no big deal. One extra thing I'm gonna be doing is introducing a drain at the front here, because um, if you can imagine, you'd reverse the car in this way, and if you're doing an oil change, right about where my seat is, you're gonna need a drain, because there's always a spill. You can either get a rag and clean it up all the time, or the easier way might be just to um, put in a drain so that you can just hit it with degrees a bit of uh, water and just mop it away. So that is one benefit of having um, doing the concrete way. You can actually add a few extra things. For me, the distance from here to here is already on a, such a gradient that I've only really got to carve it in here and just pipe it along and the water will have enough slant to, to go away. So it's um, a bad situation. Uh, the concrete's terrible, terrible. 
but we're working with it to get it where we want. And I'll show you the after photo of this, but um, even just the pipe, you see how much had to be gouged in there. And look at this. See how much had to be gouged in there? I mean, this is a thick slab. This is 270 mil thick. So I know that when we're taking out 20, 30 mil here, we've still got plenty. The depth on a lift like this requirement is 150 uh, mil deep at 32 MPA. And I know we've got another 100, two, sorry, 220 under there. And by lifting it up a little bit, undesirable, but, but just by bringing that concrete up about there, undesirable, but that's only like about 30 mil. And it's got high um, strength concrete with a layer of the self-leveling. And I've seen that done on other one, other lifts, and I spoke to the manufacturer, and you know, that's okay. So today, uh, finish off uh, pipe, and then put some cement over the top, glue, glue in the covers, um, clean up this, and uh, then we'll put a little bit of cement on here, a little bit of cement on here, so when the concrete has come in, they're not going to start disturbing stuff. You can see this white edge I've put along here too, that's to stop any concrete or um, basically liquid getting in there when they pour, because I don't really want um, that to create a new, you know, like start filling up in there. Um, I have to level up this drain. That's been gouged at a, a slight gradient, but I've still got to put in some um, epoxy or some self-leveler to make sure that that's a nice flow out and it marries up to the drain. All right, so that's the reasons why you would probably just surface mount your hoist. And if you surface mount your hoist, you don't have all this trouble. Next thing about it is too, if you were to do this and you're only not sure how thick your slab is, it would have been um, easier to actually cut out the whole section, dig it out with a shovel, and then put a 200, it, it requires 150, 150 slab underneath the hoist at uh, 32 MPA, but I would have gone 200 at um, you know, 32 MPA, you know, with probably, probably double Rio, um, and it would have been easier just to cut the whole thing out and sink it in. But, you know, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, well, I've only got to take out 30 mil here, and we can add 30 mil here, and that brings us up to our level, which the whole floor is going to be. So for me, that was the easier way. But if you're thinking about doing it, I think you're going to find it's easier to cut the whole thing out with a road saw, get in a forklift, lift it out, lift it out in big chunks, and um, chuck it in the rubbish. That might be your easier way. But definitely a lot of work compared to um, surface mounting. And I think that's why the sales people I'm talking to me, they're, they're like, oh yeah, let's see, uh, let's see if you, know, you get that done. So that's the stage we're at. Okay, so just looking over what we did yesterday. Um, so I've put up some pavers and some rubble and I've poured some cement over the drain here. Reason being is because um, all the concreters I've ever seen or worked with, they're, they're big boys and basically if they get to site, they're not going to be careful on anything. They just walk over everything. So this has to be able to withstand 120, 140 kilos and basically it's got to be so it can't move because there's nothing worse than going through all this trouble and then somebody big comes on site, walks on it, trips on it and goes, sorry, you know, when you've got a concrete being poured, it can't, um, it can't happen. So that's why we've done this. And now I can, you know, I can walk on this. I can walk on this pipe and it's not going to be disturbed. I just walked on it. So, I mean, it looks absolutely terrible at the moment. I poured a little bit more of the uh, floor um, concrete leveler in these yesterday just to bring it up to the exact measurement so that when they do pour no concrete comes under i can see i've got one or two spots more so i'll probably just put a very fine beading around the outside creating a little bit of a one mil divot so when the water does come in it can actually catch into the drain i gouged out these drains and they it's like four blades so it leaves a knuckle in the middle and once i put that floor lever in there it leveled it up Okay, and that actually um, has a little bit of flow now because as it was drying, I used a paintbrush and uh, sort of painted it so it has a little bit of flow. So I'll do one more little uh, little beading. Um, there's, there's 25 mil on either side, so there will be enough room for that little beading without um, being an uneven surface. Okay, so uh, the middle pipe looks good. Um, what I did notice here on this side, um, I put some concrete over this one too, is as it dried it separated so I'll have to put something there so that um, no concrete will go into this pipe because it's very critical that we're able to bring the lines through out to there. I did send another email to the people who were buying the lift off and they have replied um, so they said 110 PVC we've used 100 here you know, on the instructions on the other lifts that the manufacturer sells it said 100. 110 is 
PVC which is not readily available, we can get it, but it costs more money and it's a headache to get. And if we can use 100, I'm pretty sure 100 is going to be sufficient. He says that you can use 100, but it just makes it more difficult to pull the lines through. Considering you're not pulling it through every day, I think we'll be right. We'll just have to lubricate the lines and get them through. I mean, it's not that big a longer run. Next thing I did uh, yesterday was I put this drain in. Now, when I'm looking at this, the car's going to be here. Uh, the wheels, most likely, are going to be right on this spot right here. So that places the sump um, about there. So I'm going to have to move my drain from there to there. Because uh, that's the closest point to being under the sump. Because, you know, I don't know about you, but every time I've changed oil, I've never once not dropped a drop. You know, you're always going to drop a drop. Uh, so I'm going to, yeah, cut that in. It doesn't matter how much jackhammering I do here because this all removes uh, height. Because the more concrete here, the better because cars are going to be going over it. And because it's, the concrete's already here, it's just a whole heap of jackhammering. I've already started jackhammering here and we'll probably use thicker Rio and uh, higher MPA, probably hopefully 40 on this section here. So that that way when the cars do come over here, there's going to be less chance of cracking where the concrete's thinner. Um, even here, we've got about 120, 120 uh, depth, so it's you know, it's not that bad. Um, over here is where I'll have to do a bit more jackhammering to get the depth down, to, but that's neither here nor there. So today, what I was going to do is I was going to do some finer touches on this. As you can see, I've left in that um, bit of threaded rod at the back there. I'm going to use that. Uh, that was left over from putting in the rails when I did the screeding to get the level, but I'm going to use that to actually form up the lip so i'm doing a right angle lip on top which is bigger than the box so that we can put the boards on top i'm also going to use the same right angle and go underneath it weld them together so that when you look at it you'll see the lip coming down which will accommodate the box and then you'll see the lip coming down now this is 150 the lift is 130 mil so that gives me 20 mil to play with so what that means is that my lip will be flush to the top but coming down 20 mil and then Underneath that, it'll be another lip coming down the other um, the other bit. So when you look at it, it's just basically a, you'll see a lip and a piece of metal coming all the way around. Okay, so that's uh, what we're going to do today. There's the metal. See that metal? Ding, ding. There it is. We're going to be cutting that in, and I'm going to be putting it in with um, some poles so it can't move, welding it around the boxes. Once that's done, I think we're going to be ready to um, to cover these up and uh, put some plastic over the top so the concrete can do their thing. So it's looking looking not too bad, but it's definitely a lot of work. That's why 99% of the people would not actually recess in these lifts. Looks great, but the amount of work to make a nice job is a lot more than what a lot of people expect. All right, let's get to it. Okay, so just another update. So I've started on the second frame here, um, I've cut 45 angles and welded them. To get them perfect I've had to weld over my over my joins and then grind them back so they blend in quite nicely. Um, I'm using a die grinder, that's helped me out a lot to get right into those corners. What I did different here is I drilled a hole, I put the rod in like so, just like that. And then I used a coupling nut to bring it up to level leveled it up with my wood which is 150 the hoist is 130 so i've got 20 mil to play with and this basically is 20 mil so uh, basically the hoist should come up to the bottom of this right here which means that this will all be a lid and it's just a recessed uh recessed section so i've done that i'll have to put a little bit of gap sealer um, from that side so no concrete runs in there or from the inside either way so we don't get any concrete when they do do the pour um, this time around I left these long and I did both sides and that helped out because it gave me something steady so I did both sides, leveled them off, welded them in, it, welded them in and just tacked weld and then um, I was able to do the frame on top so last time I did the two pieces together and that made it harder so this made it easier this time but it's all these things you find out after the fact so um, this this is 150 um, and I've done it 5 mil higher so basically it just gives a little bit of a 5 mil edge so when they do the concrete this should be 5 mil higher um, or a couple of mil higher so hopefully no water will sort of run down there if water comes down here or if the car's wet or something like that um, 
so yeah we'll level all that off when we get the boards and the foam and all that sort of stuff also put that drain in too um, i've still got to connect that drain over there but that should be okay as well uh, i used a block to push the boards out because the board uh, moved in about 10 mil so i had to push it back out again now i'm just welding them up and then i'll put primer on all the welds and then i'll hit it with some gale paint and make it look nice once they're cemented in um it'll all be a lot more solid so at the moment i've just tack weld tack welded all the way around and tack welded them onto the onto the footings onto the dowel that i've put in and that's working pretty well now i've just got to do a bit more jackhammering try and lower this down as uh, much as possible so we get a good thickness of the slab because this is where the cars will be the cars will be rolling okay welcome to ground zero we are a few hours away from the concrete as they come tomorrow morning 6 a.m so this is the pit at the moment okay so as you can see there's been a massive revamp of concrete around here we started off with uh, concrete which was um, at point zero over there zero and 300 mil deep over here so what has this got to do with a hoist not much but you do need in a workshop a level floor so i've had to take some concrete put it over here then we're going to put a slab straight over the lot of it and we're going to get it up to level now looking at the hoist so what we've done here as i've uh, said previously we've made up some frames uh 25 or 25 giving us a height of 50 on this this right here we've used a uh, threaded rod with couplers brought it up to the right height leveled it off and then we've welded that in place so we've got that then we've come through with some wood on the inside to make a box um, that's all pushed in and i've even had to put a brace here to keep it from warping and all that sort of stuff come through with some silicon so the concrete won't go in there underneath that is perfectly level with the drain ready to go with a tunnel for the uh, hydraulics to come through from one to the other to the other over here for the controller now i wouldn't have had to have done any of this had i have bought um, from a manufacturer that had a pre-fabricated cage for this particular hoist this particular hoist didn't come with that and I saw another one on YouTube. He had the prefabricated sheet metal cage. They put in there, they level it up, and then they just fill it. Looked brilliant, looked beautiful. Couldn't do it. Got to work with this manufacturer. Reason being is because this particular hoist, which is going to be here, is four ton. You can't get four ton. They do three ton. They do three and a half. Bit dodgy. This one was four ton with, with uh, work cover safety rating so that is what we want because the vehicles I'm going to put on here is slightly heavier and we want more not less we want it to take the load not fail especially when you've got people working on it so throw another five grand at it and have to do all of this shit but in theory if we push on from where we're at now tomorrow they're going to lay the slab it's going to look beautiful we've got some glass too we're going to make this floor look make this floor look sexy see that a mixture of this over the floor we're going to polish it clear coat of uh clear coat of epoxy over the top of it it should look sexy the whole thing through the floor should be a hundred percent level and then we're going to come through and we're going to put some lids on these with uh, the soft material like the tire material so you walk over that you would be walking on a floor you wouldn't even know it was there that is the goal and we want it to look shit hot okay the drain at the front i dropped this down by 10 mil today because i want it to be that slight bit i already had five but i thought no i'm going to go for a little bit more i'm hoping tomorrow the concreters were going to get this nice and it's going to be like just a nice you know maybe 15 mil slant like a cone around here because i tell you what when i drop oil if that goes down that drain i'm going to get a hard on because then i'm not scrubbing my floor i'm not fucking around but at the moment, turning a bad situation, hopefully into a good situation. A lot of work has gone into this. We've got this drain up the front here because we were getting a little bit of water overflow from that. It was hitting the door and coming through, coming on the workshop floor. If we have polished floors, that's not going to work. The water has to stop there. We have a 250 mil drain going across in front of the door. We put another drain, a shallow drain, behind the door. Uh, welded up custom frame so it's a slightly bigger material than this galvanized uh, galvanized welded in same method brought it up gouged it out got the drain going now it is a shallow shallow drain and it is the pipe you can see the pipe it's got enough drop that's going to work it does work uh, we've got some grates for it over there if you can see over there those grates 
works out all nicely. Look, it was undesirable to have to do a lot of work to get it in. Um, it's better than having water on a workshop floor, which is polished. Most workshop floors, if they're polished or they're uh, epoxy, you put water on top, you're gonna, you're a uh, slipping hazard. So get the water off the floor. We want the water off the floor. Okay, so the rear's in, extra rear around the side, extra rear around the front. Doubled up. Pumps in. So to achieve the look of the blue glass basically it's just thrown over the surface after it's been screeded and then it's bull floated in so it's basically just below the surface it's not all the way through the concrete it's actually just on the surface and then once the concrete is ground it'll actually expose the color aggregate okay after months and months of jackhammering two big jackhammers i broke one or two of those little uh, impact hammers you know the hammer drills you buy went through a couple of them a fair few of the chisel bits as well we finally had it down to right level uh, prepped it primed it laid the slab and then went through and cut it these are all control joints purpose of them is to allow the slab to crack in the position you want rather than having big nasty cracks running through your floor we then actually filled all those cracks up with a special uh, filler and that allowed us to go straight over the top with uh, the polish and all the rest to end up with a nice result where you can't see the cracks Next comes the polishing of the concrete. Now, trying to rent one of these machines, it was like a hundred bucks per day. It worked out better just to hire, uh, to buy one. I purchased this one for about $1,400 offline. Uh, it came with one set of cutters basically, and they were complete rubbish. I ended up having to uh, pay a few, a few more hundred dollars to get more cutters. And then after that, I actually ended up buying some wheels. Originally, we were going for a mechanically polished concrete, but after doing the research, I found out that it was better to go for a cut and seal, which means you basically grind it down and you have to then, um, you know, shape it, put in all the all the little ramps and things that you want everywhere, and then um, go over the top with a couple of different coats of uh, polyurethane, which is meant to be uh, the best one to clean up, especially when you have oil and things on your floor. Still gives you a shine, still does all the right things, but basically I had to drag this machine around for about two weeks, going left and right, left and right, left and right over the whole thing, and then another two weeks of uh, sealing it and um, filling in the gaps and all the rest to get the final result of the polished floor. Another thing to factor in is all the chemicals we had to use. We had to use this one here to patch up any little holes, and then we needed another one to densify the concrete, make it stronger, and then we needed um, the polyurethane, and basically allow about two grand. This shit is not cheap. It's like 100 bucks a litre for this and that. Uh, it's expensive. It stinks like shit. It's going to stink up the whole place for you know 24 hours until it dries, and you've got to do another coat. So yeah, factor in another two days and a gas mask and a couple of grand. So the end result turned out pretty nice. That's the end result with the coloured aggregate and the glass and the colour of the concrete. Doing it again, I might have done it a little bit different, but all in all, it is a nice uh, textured look that complements, you know, the whole shed and all the rest. When you look down now, at least when you're looking at the polished floor, you're not just looking at some standard rocks and things. You've got a little bit of colour, a little bit of flair. So that's definitely, um, definitely going to make the, the whole area look a lot better, or feel a lot cleaner, and also complement the hoist that's going in there. All right, so an update. So I've done the skim coat. I've given it a quick rub down. I'm currently just taping it up because I'm going to respray the top frame. I've had to grind down some of the welds here. So just a little, a little spray over the top of that should make it look a little bit nicer. I've given it a vacuum, but I've got to give it a little vacuum again. I've got a few crumbs in the corner. I've worked out for the hole, I'm going to put a piece of um, gutter foam in there, cut it to size, so the half moon you won't see it going into the nowhere land of the drain. Uh, these canals, I'll leave them as they are. The question now is, do I use epoxy, self-leveling epoxy flooring uh, designed for concrete, and give it a couple of coats and try and fill in some of those rough spots, because there's a rough spot and there's a bit of a, I've um, given a, a small grind down the middle so that the water flows down the valley. I've done it on this one too, um, and it's all currently drying. It's going to need to dry for probably two weeks before I can 
put anything on it. The question is, do I do spray crete or do I do epoxy? Epoxy turns out good. It will fill the imperfections. I will lose one or two millimeters. I got that. Um, but then again, spray spray crete has a bit of a furry look to it and would probably look pretty good. Now the hoist is going to be orange scissors and black tabletop on, on top of it. Two very unfortunate colors. Um, so we've got to work with that. So we're going to have silver frame, a detailed silver top rail frame so that we can put the boards on top. But um, it's going to be orange and black. So question is, do we go black for the pits? Uh, do we just spray create them black? I mean, I could do that and that would look reasonably nice. Or do we go a light gray and use epoxy? That's the question. Let me just show you what our spray creek looks like. It's a big, huge mess here at the moment. This is spray creek. That's the finish. So, you know, little bumps everywhere, basically. For that, I think that'll not be an issue. It'll just give it like a driveway type texture because that's what that stuff is. It'll look a little bit furry, uh, which will cover up any messes, any gouges. Um, so that way I don't have to sit here and li literally polish these pits to make them look nice. If I go with the epoxy, it's going to show up whatever's underneath. Give or take, you know, a little bit with the filling and the leveling. But, you know, if you've got any lumps, it'll show. So I'm still 50-50, but that's the update. We've got the hoist coming in first of the month. Um, so we're getting ready, getting ready. So time to paint them and I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, so this is a look after resurfacing it. You can see a bit of the white coming through. You can see how uh, kind of bobbly and chunky that looks. I sprayed a quick um, highlighted black over the top and yeah, had to tape up everything. A lot of taping up to get it like that. That's looking alright. The concrete finish is from these people here, Colour Resurfacing, that's their logo, they're in um, Wetherill Park. And uh, yeah, that's all good shit. Okay, as of yesterday I was speaking to the seller of the hoist and he was saying that the installer has to bring his truck right in and if the driveway is going to be too narrow and all the rest to get the truck right in, it's going to be difficult to take off these scissor lifts. Scissor lifts are about 500 kilo a piece. So it's going to be pretty hard to maneuver them into place. I did see on YouTube another guy who managed to do it himself using just a, an engine hoist like this. And it um, wasn't, wasn't expensive. I mean, um, I picked this one up uh, second hand. Uh, it had been like three months old. And the person who actually bought it uh, was using it to install a glass pool fence. They were using it to suspend the panels. I mean, yeah, it'll work for that. Um, he paid about 300 for it. Maybe a little less. I paid him 200 for it. Probably should have paid a little less. But for 200 bucks, this piece of machinery is going to be with me for a long time. Also, um, it complements the scissor lift too. So if I ever have to pull a motor, um, you know, I can jack it up and maneuver with the with the scissor lift and then pull out the engine using, you know, the engine hoist. Didn't really need one, but I'm now the proud owner of one. But for 200 bucks, it's like, you know... They come in handy. I had one uh, 20 years ago. It hung around for a long time, pulled a couple of motors with it, and then ended up, you know, just sitting there. But if I keep this one nice, it'll probably last another 20 years. Um, they're adjustable. You can pick them up at any super cheap. Two ton, one ton, one and a half ton, 500, 500 kilos. It's got the eight ton hydraulic ram on it. Uh, the paint's still pretty good. One thing I didn't like about it was, and I was shocked, We've got plastic coasters on these, so it's plastic. What, what the F? What the F? But that's alright. Um, if they go bad, I'll be looking at their footprint. They're getting the footprint here, and I'll be changing them out. Also, another thing I was a bit shocked at, they've got no caps on them. Should have caps. Caps. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six caps. Would have made it look just a little bit better. And also, the other thing I didn't get was the bolt for the chain. I've got everything except for that. So I was one bolt short of a picnic. But it doesn't matter. And now I've got an engine engine hoist. Okay, so this is after the cleanup, after I've sprayed them. I've still got to vacuum them out now. There's a lot of crumbs in there. But they're looking pretty good. The grey's turned out a little bit darker than expected. 
and when I was doing the black accent I spilt a little bit down there so I've got a bit of a black patch there now not really going to cause me trouble never going to see it again especially when the hoist is over it the uh, metal frames I gave them a respray with uh, some gal paint uh, just to make them look nicer because yeah after um, sanding down the welds, uh, some of the welds on the corners it didn't look too good and also I wanted to make sure there was a good coating of that paint on on every exposed edge so it doesn't start off a rust mark. Still got to find the foam for the canal drain. Um, that spray on stuff even got into the into the joining hole there which makes it look nicer. There's a pile of crumbs in the corner. Uh, they're drying up pretty nice. A little bit of discoloration I could have done a little bit better with the spray creep but all in all I'm happy it's, uh, it's got a furry feel to it just like we we're talking about before okay morning time we did this yesterday afternoon and the color is all over the place the textures right the colors all over the place when I was cleaning up a little bit of water uh, snuck through you can see the whiteness come through and a couple of dots over there. Now it's not fully cured, it needs a vacuum down, but the color's all over the place, you know. I would have liked it lighter, would have liked it more, you know, more constant. So the only thing I can think of doing now is hitting it with a bit of water and seeing if we can whiten it up, seeing if it'll make a better effect. We've got the bottle, the bottle of water. So I'm gonna wet it. Kind of wet it, let it dry, see if we can wash out a bit of that pigment colour or see if we can change it, make it look a little bit better because I'm not terribly happy with it. Alright, see what we can do. Got me a bottle of water. Okay, round three. So the grey turned out with a little bit of white patchiness in it. I'm not really happy with that, so I'm just going to go round three and hit it again. This time around, instead of spraying it, I'm just going to roll it on. I've made myself some juice there. There's a litre of it, and that should be enough. It's pretty much just to put a slight colour on it. Once the colour's constant, then I can seal it. But, you know, I'm never going to get the chance to paint it again. And if it looks patchy, you know, it might look a bit shit later on. So I've gone to this much work. It's best we just have round three, and I'll paint it again. See how it goes. Okay, so after three coats, the pits look patchy again. So now's the question, do we go black or do we leave it grey and go patchy? I think I'm just going to leave it grey and go patchy. I mean we're only really going to see the sides when the hoist is lifted and I think it looks good enough. It looks just as good as it did before. Unfortunately the colour just didn't really turn out right but it doesn't really matter. I mean the floor is uh, multicoloured. Okay, just a quick look now. It's all clean. It's ready for the install. We've got our tube over this side, 100ml tubing. I'm going to cut that down a little bit. I've taped up the drain so nothing goes down there. I've cleaned the floor. Uh, the pits, okay, I gave them one more coat. I did, just so they look nicer. Pits are ready to go. They're looking good. Got about 1.5 metres all the way around uh, the pits, so there's plenty of room. I've got access coming in, and also I have uh, the engine hoist there as well just in case that's needed so it looks like we should be ready for the install on Monday and I'll record it and we'll see how we go So in this image you can clearly see how close we came. If we could have just got that truck back another 4 or 5 metres, or actually about 6 metres, it would have been straight over the top of the pits. It would have made it so much easier. Unfortunately that's as far as we could get the truck. Next came the hoist. We're going to have to do it by hoist. After watching this guy on YouTube, I thought, oh no, I hope we're not going to go through all the same problems. And luckily enough it wasn't, wasn't that bad. They managed to manipulate them slowly by slowly. It took a lot of time to actually get them in using the hoist. If they could have used their crane on the back of the vehicle, it would have made it a lot easier. So yeah, my hat goes off to him again for being patient and persisting and being able to use uh, the hoist to get it in. There are other engine cranes which would have made it so much better to actually um, lower down 
like an A-frame on either side with a block and tackle would have been so much nicer. This engine hoist is not really designed for it. And the guy on YouTube had a lot of trouble struggling putting it in. There's John having a break. Um, and I don't blame him. It was a tough day. You had to lower one side, jack it, lower the other side, back and forth, back and forth, lift it, maneuver it, manipulate it, and then shimmy it into the right position. Uh, they also used a, a quite a heavy dolly that was underneath. That certainly did help. But it was not easy getting it into the pits. The pits uh, specified about 50 mil on the sides to leave. I left about 25 all round because I wanted a nice tight fit. Uh, being a locksmith that I am, you know, I don't want any excess gaps. And um, it was a little bit tighter than normal. But it did definitely work out um, to be, you know, a tidy install and a nice install. Okay, so that's John uh, doing the install with his offsider. Sorry, I forgot his name. And one of the things you can always tell when working with a good tradie is uh, the way they work. And you can tell when you've got a good tradie the way they treat things, um, the way they handle things, their patience, their persistence. And John had all of these qualities. He's an excellent tradie. I'm really glad um, we got him in to do it. Um, it took a lot of extra work to get these in. Um, there was a lot of patience needed. I always hate it when people like standing over my shoulder when I'm installing things. This job was a long job. You know, he got here at 8 o'clock in the morning. I think he left at like 4 o'clock in the afternoon and he was at it flat out. Um, you know, no breaks, just keep going until you're finished. Um, he cleaned up everything. He was um, methodical in his work. And a lot of time when you're on a big job and it's taking a long time, a lot of people get tired or they get frustrated. Not John, not his outsider. They did everything right. Uh, they were very respectful um, to my floor they were very respectful about uh, the edging and all the rest which was a concern for me because i wanted to look nice they vacuumed up they cleaned up there was no spills nothing so i can't speak um, highly enough about uh, john and his offsider from Gosford hoist they really did do a fabulous job of getting it in there and i'm glad they did it not me because that would have taken me weeks to be able to work out all those little bits and pieces uh, which way to put them in i mean just lining up the hoist and working out which one's left which one's right and all this sort of stuff it was, you know, a good 20 minutes for these guys to work it out, you know, making sure you put it in once, it's going in the right spot. If I'd done it, most likely I would have put one in and then had said, no, that's the wrong one, pull that one out, put that one in. And uh, they were very patient. I had a lot invested, so, you know, I did kind of stand over their shoulder. I apologise for that, guys, if you're, if you're watching this. But they were patient and um, they did a fantastic job. So the lifts are all in and then it came balancing, bleeding, uh, airlines and all that sort of stuff. And in the end, time to give it a test. And voila, she works good. I can lift that vehicle all the way to the roof and uh, still have clearance above it. So all in all, it was a success to get it in and uh, a busy day. Just a quick safety note. You see those little black blocks on the floor? You don't see me doing it, but I actually get under there, roll under and put those black blocks, the chocks underneath the pickup points of the vehicle. Each vehicle has its own pickup points. So do your research, find out where they are. This type of hoist is not one. It looks like it, you know, you just drive on and you just push the button and it goes up in the air. But no, you actually have to get under there, find out where the pickup point is, and then jack it up on that pickup point so you're not squeezing brake lines or pushing or damaging anything underneath the car. I already did my research to find out about this because you would think that a machine like this would come out with some sort of user manual. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't. So it all came with an install manual. So you actually have to do your research afterwards on how to use it and where to jack it up. And that's pretty much it. And nothing else I need to do to it? No. I must admit, they do look pretty sexy. <laughs> they're in the ground, they're lined up, they're square, they fit level. They definitely look good. This sort of comes off. Only for a while. But when that hits the bottom of the car, they're yep. leaving off. Okay. As you can see now, yep. it's evening itself up and it goes all the way up, all the way back down even. So they'll push up even once they yeah, take, once, once they, the pickup, they'll go to the pickup. Well, with, with oil, it will take the path of least resistance. Yep. So if, if that comes up first and hits the bottom of the cap, that one will stop and that one will catch it up. Gotcha. And then they'll both go up together. Gotcha. Yeah, when I measured them, when they were both up, they were both pretty much spot on. Ready. <laughs> there was like three, there three mil difference. Procedure in the book. Yep. <laughs> If you've got to sort of you know, um, translate it from Chinese English to be able to understand yeah. it. Yeah, I did read the manual. And we've got the lead valves, they're good, tank's full. 
down the bottom, the thing with the regulator you said. Yep. And 60 psi is what you're on. 60 should, should do it. Yeah. Yep. That's cool. So it's just that pressure regulator. You just lift that. Simple. Twist it. The top. Yep. Lift that up. When you don't want it, when you don't want to be able to move it, just press it down. Lift it up, and you'll be able to adjust Twist it. it. Yeah, yeah. And bleed, gauge. bleed the water if you get any. Yeah. Well, I think when the pressure's off, it'll bleed itself. It's a spring loaded. So when the pressure's off, it will lift, and all the, the water, the moisture, any moisture in there should bleed out. You need to you need to put that in hard yeah. pipe that in, eh? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll run a pipe to it. That's yeah. no problems. Do you want us to leave this out yeah. so you can muck around with it? Yeah, no, that, that's fine. That's well, fine. Everything everything should go in the box now, and and this will just sit up sit over the top of there. Okay. So I think it's an awesome install. You, you did well getting it all in and coming down the driveway. <laughs> and if anyone needs a uh, hoist, you call John yeah. from Gosford, uh, Gosford, Gosford Hoist. Gosford hoist. Yeah, no, I really appreciate the job you did. I know it uh, was fiddly enough, but it definitely, definitely looks good. Okay, so the control unit actually needs air lines to lower the locks. So inside there was a regulator for the air, but there was no connection to actually allow the air compressor to connect to that. So that was an unforeseen thing. Luckily enough, I had one on site. The next thing is, you see the size of that drill bit? That's like a 300 mil uh, masonry drill bit going into that concrete there he's drilling it in with. And luckily enough, when he was drilling and I asked him, oh, did you actually you know, go through the slab? And out of all of them, there was only one hole where he just went through when he stuck that whole drill bit all the way down. So that was a testament to how thick that concrete was on the first slab round. So that was good to know, and that was reassuring to know that you know if he can't get through with that drill bit, that's a lot of concrete under there. The next thing to mention is uh, the control unit it needs 15 amp, 240 volt. Now, it didn't even come with a plug, and I thought for you know a 10 grand hoist, you'd at least get a, a $5, $10 you know plug so you can plug it in. Even every bit of you know rubbish you buy off uh, eBay from China always comes with the the right plug, but this no, it didn't. So luckily enough, I had one of them on site. Okay, this is a lift car lift. First go, here we go. <laughs> Safety checks. Okay, looks okay. Up we go. Getting close now. Okay, and that's it. Let's engage the locks. Okay, it's now off the hydraulics and on the locks. Very, very pretty. Okay, now let's have a look. What's the clearance? Okay, so I'm going to measure from the lowest point. Just get my tape measure. The lowest point, I've probably got 1.7 because of that bar going across. 1.7. Very sexy. And from the roof on this particular van, I've probably got another 400 mil. Very sexy. Okay, down we go. So it goes up first and then down. Alright, 
we'll just stop there for a sec. So this is, um, I forget the model number, I think it's 60T uh, EAE, and it is rated to four ton. You can see 400 kgs. Now this vehicle on its own is probably two ton, and when you start putting all the stuff in the back of it, you're probably gonna be up to about three ton, three and a half ton, three two. But I wanted that extra 800 kilos, and I paid the extra because it's um, rated at, at four ton. So it's always better to have more than less. Down we go. So it goes up and then down. Another thing I just want to quickly point out is that when you've got a hole in the ground, everything falls in that hole, whether it's dirt, water, uh, nuts and bolts, pins, you name it, it's going down in the hole. So by having covers on these, stops all that rubbish from going down. It allows it to remain on the surface, you can vacuum it and sweep it. Another problem is that water, water will find its way down there as well. So I spent extra time actually um, slightly, very, very slightly, if you can see it, putting a valley in there, about a two mil valley. So when water comes down here, it goes into the drain. And of course we had to do that all the way around, preventing the hydraulics from getting any moisture under there, which will remain under there, being enclosed, and also keeping it dry and clean. For anybody who works on their own cars, uh, you might know that being underneath a car with a jack up your ass or making love to a fire engine um, car ramp, you know, while you've got your hands in the never never or the black hole of space trying to fix something is undesirable. And I was pushed into a position where I had to do a lot of work and I thought, well, since I'm doing a lot of work on this floor, I might as well just go all the way. And, uh, but to start off with, um, I'll give you a few warnings. It is a lot of work. I could have done this a lot cheaper and a lot quicker just by bolting it onto the surface. But in my workshop, I want to hoist, but I don't want to put it in the middle of the of the space. It's not my primary thing to be repairing cars. I do it once a month. I don't do it every single day, 10 times a day. So I want it, but I don't want to see it. Um, if I had gone for surface mounted, I'd have to see it, trip on it, and I couldn't move stuff around. It would always be in the way, pain in my ass. The other option is um, a hoist that comes on like a pallet jack uh, but we're lifting up some pretty heavy cars and I didn't like that idea either I wanted something more sturdy so the next option is a two or a four uh, post hoist and if you see this space could you imagine a two or three post hoist the whole garage would be dedicated to it you'd be tripping over it uh, shimmying your way around it's just not going to work so this was the outcome and this is what we've ended up with now this works for me because it's there but it's not there it's a pretty nice bit of kit. Now, for anyone who's thinking about doing this, watch the rest of the video and you'll get, uh, you'll see kind of what I had to go through to get this in. And um, a few warnings, and I've got to refer to those gambling um, signs you see in all the pubs and clubs in New South Wales. A little sign on the wall there that says, uh, think about your choices. And these are the choices. You can go to this extent, or you can just bolt it on the surface. Bolt it on the surface, you're going to be done half the price, a lot quicker. That's one choice. Now, uh, the next gambling sign you can think about is how will your choices affect your family? Because if you have a good relationship with your wife and you decide to say, I'm going to put in a hoist, you're probably not going to have a good relationship after you get the hoist. They just don't understand. They don't understand the money, the time, the effort, um, you know, on how, how much of a, you know, how much you want this thing. And the reason you want this thing is because you're the one who's got to work on the cars, not them. They don't understand what it's like being under the car and having to, uh, you know, do these types of things. So when you say it, they'll probably say, why, why would you want one of them? And then you've got to go through justify it, and then you've got to justify it to them. And it's just, it's a nightmare, okay? That's the next one. Um, third one is, I went for a four tonner. If I had gone for a 3.5, I could have had it for half the price, okay? Uh, the next one is, I got the, it installed professionally, the hydraulic lines and things like this, uh, best to get it done professionally. Look, if it's going to be lifting four, four or three ton above your head, then by all means, you know, if you want to mess around with it, go, go for it. But I decided to get it done professionally so there's no leaks and it's a little bit safer. When we come to the control box, if you are going to get this done, you're going to need a 15 amp plug down there. Lucky I had one. And you're going to need an air compressor nozzle, one of these ones, because it doesn't matter how much you pay for the hoist, how much you pay for the whole thing, it's not going to come with one. Uh, so luckily I had those two things on site. The only two things left for me to do now is build some benches, um, a bench and some shelving, four metres high by 10 metres wide. 
pretty big bench, pretty big shelving. So I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to be incorporating this into the bench. And then it's just a simple matter of um, recessing this either on the front or making a lid that comes up like a washing machine um, that's part of the bench to hide the controllers because that, all that will be hidden. The next thing I've got to do is uh, fix up my drain. Now this drain here, um, it's a little bit low for me, so I'm going to have to uh, sand it back, fill it full of epoxy. And at that stage I might be a little eccentric and... I might put some one and two dollar coins in there and um, a little couple of old clocks as well because that's the drain and when you're doing this type of project um, a lot of money and a lot of time goes down that drain then I'll just uh, fill it with a bit of epoxy. Okay that concludes our hoist video and what it took to get it in. End result I'm pretty happy with it. I think it's one of the nicest looking uh, hydraulic hoists that I've ever seen. Leave your comments down below what you think. Uh, did you get anything from it was anything interesting to you if it was go ahead and hit that uh, like button or share it or subscribe all of that sort of stuff kind of helps us out i will do another video on the concrete uh, what led us to this and i'll also do another video on the garage build as well so all of those videos will be yet to come i haven't done them yet because they do take a lot of time so be patient and uh, yeah leave your comments down below it's always good to see what other people think to think if i did a good job bad job if you think i'm crazy if you think it's some sort of midlife crisis thing but you've got to remember too, if you're going to have a midlife crisis, you need the tools and the money to do it. And if you don't, you've got to prepare for it. And a hoist is a good thing to start off with. Thanks for watching.